Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's an exciting day to be in God's house. We're glad that you've chosen to be here as well. It's my privilege to say before you, uh, welcome to Second Baptist Church. A couple things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, number one, uh, Tuesday is an election day. Uh, there is a lot on the line Tuesday. So pray about that. Get out and vote. Christian voices need to be heard this Tuesday. Uh, 7 to 7 of the precinct, so be sure and uh, do your part in that coming coming up. Uh, Bible studies tonight, we're, we're uh, getting down to the end of those. Uh, the plan right now will be the first Sunday in September, or not September, first Sunday in April. We will start a, a study called the Baptist Faith and Message. Uh, right now the plan is this to be a church-wide study. I think it will, will be good to have a refresher course and being reminded of why we believe what we believe and just kind of give us an update on, on what we need to, to be praying about, what we need to be doing, and be mindful going forward as a church body. Uh, anything else that we need to, to mention today before we get into our, our worship time? I do have a text I want to read from our Flame of Fire team. It says, we are in the midst, this comes this morning, it says, we are in the midst of our Lord's Day schedule. God's Spirit moved in the three churches where we preached in Zambia. Several commitments were made, and our total report for professions has reached 1,021, with an evangelism conference and a Jesus film event remaining this day. Our next four U.S. team members are halfway through their, their travel journey and will be with us tomorrow. Thank you for being such an awesome partner in the Lord's ministry here. Lord, keep the fire burning. That is from Brother Craig, Brother Steve, and all those on the ground in Malawi. So, uh, continue to, to pray for that. Obviously, the, the numbers that we're seeing, the reports that we're getting, is that God is moving. Uh, lives are being changed, and uh, they're sharing the gospel and a couple other things, big events coming up. So continue to pray for them, uh, for safety and protection, but also to continue to put people in the past to, to hear the preaching and the teaching and be subject to, to the film coming up as well. Anything else? All right, I'm going to say a word of prayer, then we're going to show a video uh, from the North Canadian Baptist Association uh, National uh, Service Day coming up. I can't remember the actual date. But April 1st, that'll be in the, in, the, in the film. You can order shirts, and I think the film will speak to it. I have the order form at home, so if you're interested in ordering a shirt for this uh, service day, uh, please let me know, and uh, I'll get it ordered, and we'll get it to you. But uh, if there's nothing else, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll start that video. Father God, we just thank you uh, so much for this day, Father. We thank you for just uh, uh, bringing us into your house on this day, Father. Father, we thank you for the reports of, uh, in, in Africa that we're hearing, Father, the, the decisions that we made for you. And Father, we, we give you thanks. We give you honor and glory for those, those decisions and those lives being changed. And Father, we just continue to ask for those on the ground that uh, you give them safety and protection. Father, you give them a rest. Father, you also just continue to put people in their past, Father, for them to share the gospel with, but people in their past, Father, that need to, to know who you are. And as they continue to, to teach and to preach, Father, I just pray that uh, you do just keep them safe, Father, and that uh, many more lives will be changed. Father, help us that are here in Augie and throughout the state of Oklahoma, Father, help us to, to go across the street to our neighbor. Help us to have a conversation with someone that we, we come in contact with this week, Father, that is lost, may not know you as your Lord and Savior, Father, but we pray that... Uh, uh, through your guidance and direction, we would have a chance to share the gospel with them in the coming days. Father, we just thank you for this service. Father, we just lift up your brother Shan as he comes and opens up your word. Father, hide him behind the cross on this day. Father, I pray that what we hear from him this day is something that we need to hear on this day. Now, Father, we just ask, be with us throughout this day. Pray your spirit be upon us. And Father, we love you for who you are and for what you're going to do in our midst on this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Hello there, I am Matt Collier, and this is Katie Holdaway, and we are coming to you on behalf of the North Canadian Baptist Association Missions Planning Team. We want to take a few minutes of your time and share with you about a mission opportunity we are making available for anyone and everyone. So on April 1st, we are asking all of our churches to come together and get beyond the four walls of their churches and serve the communities of Henrietta and Dewar. We know the Bible makes it clear that to be liked, we need to serve. We are asking you to come 
and help us as we serve local communities and spread the light of Jesus Christ. We have even put together a shirt that you can order for $12 so that people will know that we are all part of the serve day. In the next few weeks, we will be placing the shirt orders. Shirt orders need to be made by March 10th. Our goal is to get as many people as we can out to serve. We will have projects and tasks in these local communities that anyone can help with. During the projects, we will be taking the opportunity to share the gospel and invite those we help to the local churches and to the evangelism rally that evening. We know that many people never have the opportunity to go on a mission trip, so we want to provide an opportunity to do mission work right here in our own backyard. We will meet at 9 a.m. at First Baptist Henrietta, get our assignments, pray, and then go serve. We will be done by around noon. So here is what you need to do. Circle the date on the calendar, April 1st, and commit to come and serve. Spread the word and get others to join you. And lastly, order your t-shirts. We hope to see you there. together and uh, to see what God does in that uh, from 9 to 12 on Saturday. Um, and so that, that's exciting. It is happy birthday time and happy anniversary time for Southern Baptist Church. If you, you have a birthday or it's your anniversary, let's go. Come on. Happy birthday to you.
with that song and how it touches your heart, or you're here to um, just be a blessing to those that are sitting in front of you, behind you, around you, you're also here to hear the message as we open God's word where the truth is in just a few minutes. He is our comforter, our friend, and such a blessing.
be together to make decisions for our church, that you guide us to the uh, man that you have called to be the preacher of our church, Lord, and, and that he would also be a pastor and shepherd all of us, Lord, that we would be able to continue to grow in Christ, above all, that, that we would be encouraged with each other to get outside of these walls, to, to share Jesus Christ every day where, the, where we go to work, go to school,
Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, for those of you are brand new, my name is Shannon Cross, and uh, I live in Kiefer, Oklahoma, which is not too far from here. And uh, I've been helping out whenever y'all need me and whenever I can. So I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, thank you for for having me again. Uh, I'd like to start out today by getting you to think back to being young. For some of you, that's maybe a little harder, right? For some of you, it was just like maybe last year. So I don't know where that is, but think back to when you were young and think back to the things that you did that you would rather no one find out about. Right? We all have the things in our life that we did that we'd rather people not found out about. Now, obviously, there was plenty of things we'd done that we didn't want our parents to find out about, right? And, and that was okay, but then there was also the things that you didn't want your friends to find out about, right? Because they were going to, like, make fun of you if they found out about it. I was trying to think of some scenarios, and one scenario that I came up with is when I was young, like, all of my friends, we all started Cub Scouts together, right? And I, I loved Cub Scouts. It was, like, super fun. I liked putting on the little uniform and getting the little badges and... You know, the little patches to put on there. I love going to like Cub Scout rallies. I just enjoyed it. And my friends, they all liked it when we first started. But the more that I kept going to Cub Scouts, I started noticing that my friends were not going as much. And they were not enjoying it as much as I was. And so all of a sudden, what had happened is all of my friends that were my age quit going. And so what I, I, I wanted to keep going, so I found another group that I could continue to go to Cub Scouts with, with people I didn't really know. And I remember, like, I still enjoyed going. I still enjoyed putting the shirt on, the little scarf, the little, you know, sliding the thing up, and just dressing up. To go. I loved it. But one day, I was leaving my house. I walked out the door, and my friends were walking down the street. And they saw me in my Cub Scout uniform, and they didn't know that I was still doing it. And I remember them pointing at me and laughing at me and saying, ah, Shannon's going to Cub Scouts or whatever. And... And at that time, I was embarrassed. It embarrassed me, and I thought, I'm not going to do Cub Scouts anymore. And I, and I, I quit doing Cub Scouts, and that's super sad to me because now I could care less what other people think. But you know, when we're young, we have a, a tendency to care what other people think. Another, another example that I let what other people thought about me affect me is back in the 80s, the early 80s, there was this pop star by the name of Michael Jackson. Y'all remember him? Yeah. And he had this really cool jacket in the Beat It video. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It had all the zippers on it, right? I bought one of them, right? I can hardly wait to wear that thing to school. I wore it to school one time. Oh, and gosh. all of my friends made fun of me. I still, to this day, think it was the coolest jacket ever. But I wore it, and I remember it was a cold day, and I wore it, and I showed off. I showed up, and I was super excited to be wearing that jacket, and they all made fun of me. I let it bother me so much that at recess, I didn't wear it, and I froze that day. You know? <laughs> and so, like, I never wore it again, except one time I worked at the grocery store, and there was, like, you know, a teenager, like, 16 or 17-year-old, that worked at this grocery store in Sepulpa, and he saw me in this jacket. He's like, man, that jacket is so cool. I love that jacket. And so every time I went to the grocery store with my dad, <laughs> I made sure that I wore that jacket so that guy would see me in it. Because he thought it was cool, you know, and he was older. And I think it's sad that we let what other people think about us affect everything we do. You know, and that's true. And, like, and that starts at such an early age because we have friends that make fun of us, you know. And, and your parents always say, if they were laughing, you don't need them. They're not good friends, right? And you're like, you know, the old rap song parents just don't understand or whatever. You know, it, it just starts at a young age. You're like, you're, you're so conscious of what you wear and all this stuff. And so we care about what other people think. But if we're really honest, sometimes today we still care about what other people think. And so today we're going we're gonna to look at, at a story of a guy by the name of Nicodemus. And he had heard about what had happened with Jesus. He, he had heard about all these things that, that Jesus was doing, the miracles, and all of these things that were happening around Jesus. And so he wanted to check out Jesus for himself. He wanted to see if all the stuff that he was hearing was true. But he still had to think, he had to care about what other people thought because of his position in life. And so what he did is he went to Jesus at night when no one else was around so he could talk to Jesus and, and find out if all these things that he was hearing are true. And, you know, we've all been there. You know, maybe for some of you, I love it that you all have youth here. And, you know, and I love it. It's the same youth. 
Like I, I see them here every Sunday I come in. I'm starting to recognize their faces, and I love that. Because that tells me that they don't care what anyone else thinks about them. They're still going to come to church. Right? And we know when you get older, it's a little easier to come to church. But when you're young, like, you've got to make that decision. Unless your parents are just driving here. I don't know. That could be the truth. But, you know, for, for most of you that are young, you have to make that decision for yourself to come. And, and get to the point where you don't care what anyone else thinks. That Jesus is important to you that you're still going to come. And so those of you that are young in this room, I appreciate you being here. Um, and that you don't care about what anyone else thinks. But today we're going to look at the person of Nicodemus in Scripture who wanted to look into Jesus, but he did not want everyone else to find out about it. So he came at night. Uh, so when I'm done here today, the main idea that you will have learned is what it looks like to have an encounter with Jesus and to be born again. So we're going to read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Obviously, we're going to end on the verse 16. We all know the verse 16. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. And, and uh, it's one of the first verses we learn, one of the first verses we memorize. And even a lot of people that are not Christians know the verse John 3.16, right? And so uh, we're going to look at that. But let's go ahead and read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with you. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the, the word of God that changes our life. And God, I pray that this, this passage of scripture today changes our life. I pray that this is not another Sunday that we just come in here, sit here for a while, sing some songs, listen to the, the minister of the Lord and then leave. But I pray today changes our life. I pray that we want to be different. I pray that we will listen with our ears and with our hearts and our minds and that we will be different when we leave here than our God, I, I, I thank you for the people that are in this room. I thank you uh, that they love you and I thank you that they understand that they are not here by accident this morning. I've already heard that twice and I, I truly believe it. And I thank you that they believe in prayer, Lord. And what a great way to start out uh, with uh, just a prayer time. And so I just pray that, that you will do what only you can do in our lives. And I pray that you would change our lives. And just uh, thank you for all you're doing. Continue to work in this church. Be, be with them in their search for a pastor. But God, I pray that all of us will hear your word today and know what exactly we need to do. It's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Yes, so we see in verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Now something that I like to do uh, whenever I'm preaching, so people will understand this, is when I say the word Pharisee, I would like you to boo. So let's try this. Pharisee. Boo. How often do you get to boo the preacher in church, right? <laughs> right. So anytime that I say the word Pharisee, boo. there you go. You already got it. I would like you to boo. So... Yes, and uh, it's, it's funny because sometimes they were catching me off guard. But yeah, so Nicodemus, 
before men, right? And so we kind of want to boo them because they were the people that, that acted like they had everything together, that they followed the law as, as much as they could, and they did, and they tried to be better than everyone else. And so they were, I call them religious do-gooders that, that tried to do the work to be seen by everybody else. Now, if you've heard me preach before, I always say this. Our job is when we hear the passage of Scripture, we try to put ourselves into the passage, Right? So today, you have, you have two people that you can relate with, either Jesus or Nicodemus, right? And we're probably going to be Nicodemus in the story because sometimes we are just like the Pharisees. Boo. Yes. Uh, we do things to be seen by everybody else uh, to make ourselves look good. And whether we, we don't like to admit this, but sometimes we'll teach Sunday school or sometimes we'll come to church or sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll attend activities We'll sing in the choir. We'll serve as a deacon. We'll hold a position in church just to make ourselves look good. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. But sometimes we're motivated by doing that. We're like, well, i got to go to church today or people are going to look down on me if I'm not there. You know, if I'm not, if I'm not doing this, then people are going to look down on me. And so that's the reasons that we're serving the Lord more than wanting to serve the Lord. And so we're just like them. And so that's kind of where it's at. But Nicodemus... Last time. He was a Pharisee Boo. and a ruler of Judah. I say it's last time. I may mess up again, but you never know. But Nicodemus <laughs> came to Jesus and said, uh, a member of the Jewish ruling council, and in verse 2, it says that he came to Jesus at night. And we've already established the reason he came to Jesus at night is because he didn't want everyone to find out what he was doing. I got one more example of where this happened to me in my life. But unfortunately, it was just a few years ago. Now, you know, I'm getting older. I'm almost 50, right? So I'm at that last part of my 40s. Actually, I'm 49. And just a couple of years ago, um, I went to a skate park to go skating with somebody, right? And so it's sad, but I still skate. I still try to ride a skateboard. And it's not very smart because the older you get, the re you realize your body doesn't bend as quick as it used to, right? And so, anyway, one of my friends uh, was going to the skate park in, in Owasso, and he called me up and said, hey, you want to meet me over there? And I said, yes, I'd love to. So luckily, I had my skateboard in the trunk of my car, and I go meet him at the skate park, and we're skating. And, and I'm a little, you know, a little scared compared to all the youngins there, but I'm still trying to, trying to skateboard and stuff like that. And what the problem is, is we went at like 5 o'clock, you know, and it started getting dark. So I did what any normal person in their 40s would do. I said, hold on, I got to go to my car and get my glasses so I can see, right? Because your eyes betray you when, when you get older. And so whenever I went to my car, I got my glasses, and I remember I picked them up, and I picked up my glasses, and I threw my keys down, and I shut the door. And as it was shutting, I realized that I had hit the door lock. And I was like, no. Is the door shut? And my keys got locked in my car, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to do? And so I did what any guy in their mid-40s did. I called their mom. I called my mom. I was like, mom, I locked my keys in my car, and I need you to come let me in my car. Because, you know, you always should have a set of keys somewhere else. And she said, okay. And I said, well, can you just meet me at the mall, and, and then uh, then you're going to have to give me a ride to this, this place. And she's like, okay. Well, my mom had a friend with her that I'd never met. She was telling her friend how cool I was, right? And what a great son I was and all that. And so whenever my mom shows up at the mall to pick up her little boy that is in his mid-40s, I walk up to the car with a skateboard in my hand. And my mom's like, this is my middle-aged son who still thinks he can skateboard. She's like, you were skateboarding? And I was like, yes, and now you've got to give me a ride to the skate park, right? And so, I, you know, and she introduced me to, the, to her friend, and, and I was all embarrassed. And I, you know, I didn't want her to know I was still doing that, because I know she's probably hoping that I would eventually grow up and get married and have kids. But no, I'm still, like, riding skateboards and playing football and so like, all of that stuff, you know? So anyway, uh, there's, that was a time that I would rather my mom and not find out what I was doing, or other people for that matter. And so this is the same thing with here, Nicodemus. He holds this important position in life, right? People look at him as a religious, do-good person. And he understood that he had heard some things 
about Jesus. And so he said, I'm going to see uh, what, what these things, if I'm hearing about Jesus, are true. So honestly, God was doing something in Nicodemus' life, and he had saw that there was something different about Jesus. Now remember, I said that we are going to relate to Nicodemus in the story, and I believe this. We heard this earlier. You were not here by accident. Please understand that today. I don't care how you got here, if you were drunk here, if you came on your own, you woke up at the last minute and decided to come and you thought it was your idea, I would tell you this, you were not here by accident. And just like Jesus was working in the life of Nicodemus and drawing him to himself, that's the same thing for every one of us in this room. You were here because God wanted you to be here today and because God is doing something in your life. And so we can relate to Nicodemus just, just like Nicodemus. So here's something that Nicodemus recognized. Jesus had come from God because of the things that Jesus had been doing. And it's important for us to understand this. You can't deny the things that Jesus is doing. You see God, you see Jesus take a hold of someone's life and totally change it. You can't deny that. Right? People want to know, show me evidence for God. That's the evidence. When you see the life change in someone's life. And so in verse 2, Jesus came at night, or he came to Jesus at night. And he said, Rabbi, we know your teacher has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. Wouldn't that be great for people to say that about your church? Amen. Like, man, that church is on fire. And, they all, and, and God is doing something awesome there. And you know it's from the Lord, right? We, we would all do that. So the first thing we see, found a verse, uh, found a, actually, I'll say this. The very first, first point that I'm making is this. You must be born again. Yeah. Very simple. You must be born again. You want to know what verses this is found in? Verses... Uh, 1 through 16. So like my first point covers the whole rest of the, the section that we've read. So you must be born again. It's found in verses 3 through 16. Now when we heard, hear the word born again, some of you already said amen because you understand what the word means born again, what the word born again means. We understand that because we grew up in church and we've heard that phrase over and over and over. For some of us, we would say you must get saved, Right? Churchy words. We use these church words all the time. I like to say this. You must have a relationship with Jesus. You know, that's what I say for the words born again. But we hear the words born again. We understand it. But this is going to have to be explained to Nicodemus because he has no idea what Jesus is talking about when he says born again. Verse 3, Jesus gets right to the point. In reply, Jesus, through, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he has been born again. Jesus gets right to the point and says, you must be born again. In other words, he's saying there had to be a change in the life of Nicodemus. And that's the question we've got to ask ourselves. Has there been a change in our life? We claim to be born again. We claim to be a follower of Christ. Has there been a change in your life? To born again, it's a word that we throw around a lot in church. But I don't think we understand what this phrase truly means. Most people believe that they're, they're automatically going to go to heaven because they were born into a family of Christians. I would, say that, I would say that there's someone in this room right now that you would say that you are going to heaven because your family is Christians and because your family is in church and you're in church with them. Some of you would say that you are going to heaven because your friends go to church and you're in church every Sunday hanging out with them. But I will tell you this, if there's not been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and become truly born again, then you are not going to heaven because that's what the scripture says, Right? And so we have to understand that what it means. In verse, verse 4, Nicodemus wants to make sure he understands this. So in verse 4 he says, How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he could not enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. So this is, was important enough for Nicodemus to realize that he could not miss what Jesus was trying to say. And we have to understand that too. We can't miss this. When Jesus said we must be born again, there has to be a time in your life that you surrendered your life over to Jesus Christ. There has to be that time in your life. Jesus, uh, Nicodemus did not want to miss this. He wanted to make sure that he understood the point. And so he asked the question, what does it mean to be born again? He wants clarification, uh, clarification of the answer. And so he says, how can someone who is old be born again? All right. Those of you that are older in this room, stop and think about this for a minute. Nicodemus <coughs> might have been wishing at this time. Right? Maybe he was thinking... If I could be born again, I would do things differently. Those of us that are older, how many of you, if you could go back and change the things you knew, would do things differently? 
Show of hands, right? Yeah, most of us is rude, man. We have made some dumb mistakes in our life. Let's just be honest, right? And if you could go back and do it differently, you would, right? You wouldn't maybe make that one decision that changed your whole life. If you could do things differently, you would go back. I'm sure that's what Nicodemus is hoping, right? And so Nicodemus asks the question. He's like, how, how can this be? How can I do this? Uh, what does it mean to be born again? And then verses 5 through 7, uh, Jesus makes it very clear on how to be born again. Jesus answered, verse 5, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised by saying you must be born again. So Jesus' answer makes it very clear on how to be born again. He gives a checklist or a to-do list. So Anyone in here a to-do list person or a checklist person? I'm that type of person. I get that post-it note every day and slap it on my desk and I start writing everything that I need to do. And I love checking it off after I've done it. I've done that, I've done that. You feel productive when you do stuff like that. If you don't do that, I challenge you to try it. You know, just like make a to-do list, like brush your teeth, take a shower. Come Once you do it, you feel super productive. You're like, man, I've already done all these things on my checklist, right? And so Jesus gives us a checklist or, or a list that we can check off to make sure that we are born again, right? And he gives us two of them. He makes it very clear. Here's, here's what's on the checklist. If you want to know whether you're born again, this is the checklist to make sure you've been born again. Number one, born of water. That is a physical birth. And every one of us in this room right now, you can check that off your list. So he gives us a, lit, a checklist of two, right? The first one is that you have to be born physically. Every one of you in this room are halfway there already because every one of us in this room have been born physically. Uh, we can check that off our, our list because we have all been born physically. And then the second thing he tells us is that you've got to be born in the Spirit. Now, I can't tell you that all of you in this room can check that off your list. But this means, this is where you have made the decision in your life to give your heart to Jesus and follow him. You have repented of your sin and surrendered to God's will for your life. So when I'm saying that there's a checklist, he said, you must be born again. He says, how can you explain to me what born again means? And he says, it's very simple. First of all, you've got to be born physically. All of us have that now. The second of all, there has to be a time in your life you're born in the spirit. But there's a time in your life when you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, forgive you your sins, and you've made him the Lord of your life. Now understand this. There is evidence for both of these, right? Can you offer evidence that you have been born today? Yes. Yes. All you got to do is breathe in, you know, breathe out. You know, you walked in here, you know, you can talk, you can make noise, you can do all these things that offer evidence that you have been born physically. But here's the, here's the, the real question. Can you offer evidence that there was a time that you were born again? that you've been born spiritually. Can you offer that evidence? Has there been a time in your life? For me, it's when I was 12 years old in vacation Bible school. I walked down the altar, I talked to the preacher, and I said, I'm not saved, I need to be saved. And he told me how to be saved, and I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. Changed my life, changed the outlook of my life, changed the direction of my life, and not only did it change my life, it's changed the life of so many people that God has placed in my life. And that's the same for you, right? Has that, has that happened? So, number two, the second point I'd like to make which could be the first point if you realize that the whole thing is about being born again, is you must have evidence that you are born again. So verse 6, it says, uh, Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. How do you know that you are born of the flesh? You have fleshly desires, right? That's how we know. Um, you have sin in your life, and it starts when you're a little kid. What are the first words that a little kid learns? No and mine, Right? I mean, that's sin right there. You're like, you know, you don't want to share. You're just like, that's mine, mine, mine. You start crying if you don't get your way. From the time you were born, it shows you that sin enters our life and that we're fleshly people as soon as we're born, right? It's, it's, it's just, it's human nature. We're born with sin, right? And we battle that flesh the rest of our life. Even today when I was driving up here, you know, I was praying about the, the message and going through my mind, and this car just pulled over and starts going really slow. I was like, Burr! you know, I started going in my mind and spinning around. I'm like, yeah, that's that's showing right there. You're born in the flesh. You know, it's it's funny how that stuff affects us. Little things in the world affect us, and it shows their evidence that, that we have been born in the flesh. 
But second of all, there's going to be evidence that you've been born in the Spirit as well. And I'll tell you this. God will take your life, and he will use you and do things with you that you can't explain. Every one of you in this room needs to hear that. God will take your life, and he will use you in ways that you could not explain. Amen. And you have not messed your life up so much that God can't use you. We, we've, got to, we've got to hear that and know that and walk in that truth. And it will be obvious when the Spirit of God is leading you. And I'll tell you this. You take a church this size, this many people, and they all start listening to Jesus. They all start letting the Spirit lead them. I promise this, you will see an impact in this community from this church. Right? Amen. Because all of you have a relationship with the Lord. If there's been a time in your life and you've asked Christ to come into your life, that you have a relationship with, you, with the Lord and God put you in this church to do something about it. All right? Okay, so uh, verse 7. This is where a verse that people love to get offended with, right? It says, you should not be surprised by saying you must be born again. This is where the world gets offended. And they say we're judging them. Who are we to tell someone else if they're going to heaven? Right? That's what the world... How do you, how can you tell me whether I'm going to heaven or not? Jesus makes it very clear. As followers of Christ, as people that believe in the word of God, he makes it very clear that what you have to do in order to go to heaven is to be born again. If you want to be born again, if you want to go to heaven, you follow Christ. Right? If you don't want to, if you don't want to go to heaven, don't follow Christ. It's that simple. It's that simple. That's what the word of God says. Verse 7. Uh, it, it is not us that are being judgmental. You know, we're just claiming to be followers of Christ. And if you want to be a follower of Christ, then you must be born again. That's what the Word of God says. Verse 8. It says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born in the Spirit. Okay, so maybe you're in this room and you're like, I want to believe in Jesus. I want to believe in God. I just don't know where the evidence is. Right? And so here he gives us some evidence that, of the Holy Spirit working. He says, uh, uh, let me look at it again. I want to mess up. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. Now, we all can understand this, right? Because today is a super windy day. You know, like when I left the house, I made sure my hair was all perfect. I tried to get a haircut yesterday and the day before, but my haircut guy keeps not showing up. <laughs> you know, so anyway... Uh, I got my hair all perfect, and I walked outside, and it was like, you know, and then all of a sudden, it looked like the hair fairies that visited me, right? <laughs> and, and, and if I walk in here, and I've been trying to fix my hair or whatever, you wouldn't have said anything, like, hey, Shannon, how are you doing? You're super excited to see me. But in your head, you'd be like, man, this guy needs to comb his hair, <laughs> right? And the reason you would be saying that is because the wind got a hold of it, and that shows you that the wind is there. We can't see the wind. You have no idea what the wind looks like, but you can see the effects of the wind. When you see leaves blowing down the street, when you see all of that stuff, you see the effects of the wind. And I'll say, that is my evidence to believe in Jesus. People may say that Jesus is not real or God's not real and I'm crazy for believing it. And I'll say, hey, from what I've seen in my life, I've seen God work in my life so much that I cannot deny it. You know, I can't draw you a picture of what God looks like, but I can tell you I've seen the effects in my life and in so many other people's lives. And when God truly gets a hold of your life, you're going to see it. And that's the evidence of God or the Holy Spirit working in your life. You can't see the wind, but you know it's there. So number two, you must have evidence to be born again. This is found in verses 6 through 8. If I didn't say that. Number three, you must have faith to be born again. This is found in verses 9 through uh, 15. You must have faith to be born again. Verse 9, Nicodemus wants an explanation. He says, how can this be, Nicodemus asked. And in verse 10, of course, Jesus answers like he does so many times with a question. The reason he asks you questions is so you'll figure it out for yourself, right? So Jesus asks, he responds with a question. He says, you are Israel's teacher. In other words, you know the word of God better than anyone. You have studied it your whole life, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. And then verse 11, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Jesus says, I have told you the truth plainly, and you do not accept it. And I'll say, many people in the world are just like this, right? We tell them plainly how to follow Jesus, how Jesus can change your life. You know, we tell them, like, they're 
right now they're all worried that the world seems to be going crazy and spinning in a, in a weird direction and they want to know answers and you're like, I know the answers. And the Bible says the world's not going to get any better. Right? The Bible says that it's going to get worse and worse and worse and people are going to turn their backs on Jesus and you explain this to them and you say, but, but you can find peace in knowing that if you're a follower of Christ, God's, God's going to take care of you. And hopefully he raptures us out before it gets really bad. I don't know, you know if that's going to happen or not at pre-mid. I don't know. I just know that Jesus is in control of whatever's going to happen, right? Amen. And so if we understand that Jesus is in control of our life, I promise you, even though the world's going crazy, it still makes sense, mm -hmm. right? And, but we, we explain that to people, and they just they don't understand it. And here, here's maybe one of the reasons why. Verse 12, he says, Jesus says, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? How can we explain heavenly things to people when they won't accept the earthly things, right, that we have told them? People want us to explain everything about God. They want to understand all that stuff. They want to understand how the world was created in seven days or where were the dinosaurs, or, you know, how did, was it possible for for Noah to build a boat so big to actually put all the animals on it? Is that really possible? And they want to know all of this stuff. And I always say, if I could explain all of that stuff to you, would you become a Christian right now? And they're always like, well, I don't know. I'm like, no, I'm not going to try. You know, here's the deal. I can't explain all the things in Genesis, but God can. I can't explain all the things in Revelation, but God can. All I know is that Jesus made it very plain and, and clear that I need to be born again, right? And he's going to take care of all the stuff in the past and all the stuff that happened in the future. But right now, I need to focus on my, my, <coughs> my life. And God has told me to be born again, right? You have to know God before you can understand the things of God. And people always want us to explain everything about God. You will not understand everything about God, and you never will. But when you become a follower of Christ, when you become a follower of Jesus, he starts to open your mind up to understand some things that you didn't think you could. Verse 13, Jesus says that he's the authority, right? Um, uh, he says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has came from heaven. Jesus says, I'm the authority because I've been there. Now, if you've ever, let's say you're going on a vacation somewhere, right? Uh, a couple of, couple of uh, months ago in October, I went to Niagara Falls. It's always been a bucket list of mine. Ever since I watched Superman 2, that little kid falls into Niagara Falls. I've always wanted to go for some reason. You know, uh, I don't know, but it was a bucket list of mine, and finally I got to go. And so now, if you ask me what Niagara Falls is like, like, I, I went all on board. Like, I went under the falls, you know, I went down all the little tunnels. Everything I could do for Niagara Falls, I did. I took a million pictures, right? And so now if you ask me what Niagara Falls is like, I can tell you. <clears throat> The reason I can tell you is because I have been there, you know, and the more I go, the more of an expert I'll become. And so if you want to know what heaven is like, you can ask me, but I can't tell you much. I can tell you what scripture says, but I can tell you what Jesus said. And Jesus has been there because that's where he came from, right? So if anyone's going to be the expert in telling you what the kingdom of God is like, it's Jesus. Jesus is the authority. Turn your life over to Jesus. And you're going to understand the things of God so much better than as an outsider looking in and trying to figure it all out. Because it's the Spirit of God that gives you understanding. Right? Verse 14. It says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus predicts his death on the cross. Right? He, he starts telling you before it ever happened. Remember, this is John chapter 3. And he starts explaining that his purpose on earth is to go to the cross to die for our sin, right? And so number four, fourth point, you must believe in Jesus to be born again, right? There must be evidence in your life that you're born again. You must, you know, must have faith to be born again. But you must be, you must believe in Jesus to be born again. This is found in verses 15 and 16. Verse 15, it starts out with belief that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. If you want to have eternal life, you got to believe in Jesus. It can't be, I hope that I have eternal life. You talk to people like, are you going to heaven? They're like, I hope I am. And I want more than that. You've got to believe that you're going to heaven. You know, people think that it's just living a good life is going to get you to heaven. You're like, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I try to do good things. No, that's, that's not the answer. It's that you believe in Jesus Christ. 
You must believe in Jesus to be born again. It starts out with belief. Before you can understand the things of God, it starts out with faith. Noah had to have faith that God was real and that God had told him to build a boat. Or he would have been crazy, right? Everyone thought he was crazy. I'm sure there's people that think you and I are crazy for believing in Jesus. Abraham had to have faith. It all starts with faith. And now we get to verse 16, which is the verse that, that we all love and we all know. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus again predicts his death. And this, this, this verse uh, took a whole new meaning to me not too long ago. Is you know John chapter John chapter three verse sixteen we've heard her whole life. I remember being a, a teenager and I was in a revival once and that they they were uh, singing songs and the guy gets up there and he says in John chapter three verse sixteen it says for God so loves the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life and he said now that fits into the song that we are about to sing and it was love lifted me you don't know that song right. I was sinking deep and said, far from the picture shore. And it's like, love lifted me. And I always do this on the lifted part, right? Because it makes it fun, right? And so I, so he, he says, John 3, 16 fits into that song so well. And I was like, okay. So I started trying to sing the words ahead of time. I'm like, you know, for I was you know, I was sinking deep and sinking. And I was trying to figure out how that verse would fit in that. And some of you are doing that right now, right? Trying to see if it fits. You know, you know, Amazing Grace and Gilligan's Island. You can sing them together and they, they fit well. Try this one. But anyway, so I was trying to figure this out. And when he starts singing it, he sings the regular verses until he gets to the part of Love Lifted Me. And instead of saying Love Lifted Me, he was like, John 3.16, John 3.16, when nothing else could help, John 3.16. And I was like, that's not, that's not what I was envisioning, right? But we know the verse, John 3, 16, so well. We always read this verse with the understanding of what Jesus did on the cross. We know that verse. But I have always heard that, and this changed my, my mind, my thinking. I had always heard this verse that it was after Jesus had went to the cross. So God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believed in him, you know, uh, we hear that like it's something that was in the past. For us, it is. But for the audience that, he's, that he is saying it to, it's in the future. And that just, that just blew my mind, right? We always read this uh, understanding of what Jesus did on the cross, but to the original hearers, it had not happened yet. So John 3.16, man, that, that is a super important verse. Why do you think it's so popular? I'll tell you, the reason it's so popular is this. It sums up the gospel. The whole gospel is in this verse. Uh, I, one of the things, I'm a BCM director, but the other thing I do every summer is I work at Falls Creek, right? And so every, every summer before Falls Creek start, we have Falls Creek interviews. And, and we always ask them, we're like, okay, so you're going to work at Falls Creek. Uh, let's talk about your life a little bit. And if you share the gospel, uh, what's a way that you share the gospel? And they, you know, they, they'll tell you, is there any verse that you like to use when you're trying to share the gospel, when you're trying to tell someone else about Jesus, is there, do you have a go-to verse that you go to? And so, and so, so many of the kids or students or whatever, they'll look down and say, I'm sorry, but the, the only verse that I know is John 3, 16. And I'm like, exactly. You should not apologize for knowing John 3, 16 because that is the verse that you need to use to share the gospel. Because the whole gospel is in John 3, 16. It says Jesus loved the world. And what's that saying is that God loves you and me. Even if you think that you are unlovable here this morning, God loves you. Right? Even if I think I'm unlovable or I've done something that God can't forgive, I'm telling you, God loved the whole world. Right? You are not unlovable. God loves you and the unlovable. That he gave his only son. He sent Jesus down on this earth to die for our sins, right? It comes down to belief that anyone who believes in him, it comes down to belief. It's not about works. It's not about how many times you come to church or how many Sunday school classes you taught or, or anything like that. It's about belief. It's not about works. If you believe in him, understand that it's not how many times you come to church or follow a bunch of rules. It's about believing in Jesus alone, right? That you shall not perish. This is where our hope is found. I've already talked about how messed up this world is. And you can try to solve this world, but you're not going to. But when you understand your hope is found in Christ and not in this world, this world makes a lot more sense. When you understand that you are just passing through this world as a believer in Christ, this world makes a lot more sense. And you'll want to get out of it a whole lot quicker, I promise you. 
right? But the Lord still has us here for a reason. It says, if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have eternal life. For some of us, it seems like this life has went on for a long time, right? And that's nothing compared to eternal life. And so if you're not happy in this life, then you better think about eternity. Because I promise you, without Jesus, you will not be happy in eternity either, right? Jesus preached about a place called hell. And he says that if we do not believe in, in him, he says he is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So we gotta, we got we to gotta ask ourselves, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is the Lord telling you to do today? Is he telling you to put your faith in him? You know, if, if you look at it as being judgmental by us saying, hey, there's a real place called hell, there's a, there's a real place called heaven. You can make the choice to go to one or the other. It's up to you. We can't make that choice for you. Right? But the, the crazy thing about it is, is, you know, people get, get upset when we say, hey, there's a place called hell. Without Christ, you're going there. People get upset with that. But they, they should understand that we're saying, hey, you don't have to go there. Like, Jesus accepts you just as you are. Right? Just as you are. All you got to do is place your faith in him. That's all you got to do. So today I want to ask you, I don't know where you stand in your, in your relationship with the Lord right now, but I want you to think about this. Has there been a time in your life, you know, beyond a shadow of doubt, that you've asked Christ to come into your heart? Not that you just showed up to church, or you come with a bunch of friends, you come with your family, or you sat through a Bible once. Maybe you even said a prayer once, but did, was there evidence that your life had changed? Has that happened in your life? Are you actively seeing God take your life and use you to make a difference in other people's lives in this world and in this church? Right? That's the, that's the things we got we to gotta do. So the reason we have an invitation is for you to consider all that stuff and make sure that if you haven't done that stuff, then you need to take care of that. If you've never asked Christ in your life, come down here and talk to me. I promise you I'll make it as simple as possible. And, and you can ask Christ in your life and your life will change. If you've never done that, you need to do that. If, if you know that you have done that, but you're not really seeing God work in your life like you think you should, then pray about it and get serious about your faith. Get serious about what God would do with your life. Because I'll tell you this, if this many people got on fire for the Lord, don't tell them what would happen to the city of Oakland. Yeah. Right? Amen. All right, let's, let's go ahead and stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. And pray.